I'm Richard Brown from Mississippi State University, and along with Christy Yeager, we're pleased to begin with a presentation with an overview of Lepidoptera. The Lepidoptera are one of the panopoid orders, which include the Trichoptera, closely related to the Lepidoptera, the Diptera, the Fleas, and the Mycoptera. These are related to the beetles and other insects that we know all have complete metamorphosis. The Lepidoptera are unique in having lepis or scales that cover their body. These have amazing coloration, a rainbow of colors, the highest developed coloration for all of the insects. The scales are flat and have pigment sacs inside. If we look at the diversity of Lepidoptera, we see that something unique about 99% of them have females with two genital openings. This is unique among insects. There's one opening, a gonopore, that's for the copulation, and then the egg passes through a second opening, the ovipore. On this phylogeny, we see the groups, the superfamilies of Lepidoptera, and the relative diversity as measured by the width of the bar. 33% of the Lepidoptera are micros. Now we use this uh, term that's not a natural classification term, but it describes a group of Lepidoptera that have some superficial similarities, and typically they are small, but there are some micros that are as large as a foot across. There are also the macros that are as small as a few millimeters. The diversity of Lepidoptera worldwide is great, 160,000 species perhaps, in the U.S. and Canada, we have about 12,000 uh, species and 89 families. You can see the relative percentage of the microlepidoptera and macrolepidoptera or macro moths. Something that is important to point out, however, is that the microlepidoptera are largely undescribed. Perhaps 50%, 40% or so of the species in America, north of Mexico, remain undescribed. And when we go to the tropics and other areas of the world, we're talking 50, 60, 70 percent, if not more, of the species are unknown. So it's probable that the micro moths largely outnumber the macros. This table presents a accumulation curve of the species of Lepidoptera that have been described in recent years. And we see there is continued uh, increase in species with a total given on the blue line at the top. Perhaps the microlepidoptera include a lot more new species. There are fewer people working on them. The adults of Lepidoptera have relatively uniform habits. They have a proboscis, a modified maxilla, and they take in liquid food. Some of them are lacrimal feeders, feeding from tear uh, glands around the eyes, um, and some, in fact, are capable of piercing skin and taking in blood meals. There are some, however, that are primitive, primitively mandibulate, such as the Micropter rigids that have jaws or mandibles. The larvae have a wide variety of food sources from animal tissue and products like the Taneidae. And in fact, the Taneids are rather unique and there's not any or many of them that feed on plant tissue. They're mostly scavengers, feeding on fungi and lichens as well. There are several groups of Lepidoptera that are known to feed on fungi and lichens. Uh, Arctiines, for example, include several species that utilize this food source. Pollen and fern spores are used by micropterygids. And then we see large numbers of species that feed as leaf miners, feeding in the tissue of the leaf, or feeding in roots, seeds, flowers, the codling moth, for example, in fruit. And then there are Lepidoptera that are predaceous, feeding on other insects. In addition to this interesting geometric from Hawaii, there are other species, including pyralids, that will feed on scale insects. There's a blastobasin moths that feed on scale insects, and even a butterfly that will feed on woolly aphids. So predation is not uh, only found in, in this species, but in several other groups of Lepidoptera. Their habits are quite diverse. You have some, as I mentioned, that are leaf miners. And I've been in the field with uh, specialists working with these, and they can take that leaf, they can hold it up and look at it with their magnifying glass, and they can tell you 
not only the family, they can tell you the genus of the leaf miner, and in some cases the species if they know the host plant. So these miners have unique forms of mines that aid their identification. There are other species that bore in stems and roots and fruits. I call them the, the from root to fruit. And they're protected inside these plant parts. And typically they are pale. They're very little coloration with them because they're these internal feeders. There are also a large number of species that are leaf rolling. They'll take the leaf and with silk roll it and feed from within. This perhaps is very important for protecting them from desiccation because you can open leaf rows. You can find spiders and other predators inside. They are parasitized, but this perhaps provides a micro environment for them to avoid desiccation. We also have a large number of species in different families that form galls feeding in this protected area that's uh, swollen around their body and these gall formers you can see uh, many different plants especially the asters the composites have many gall formers we have a large number most of the higher lepidoptera are exposed feeders and with the caterpillars that are out and exposed you see many that are cryptic they are leaf-like they're difficult to see and the best way we have for collecting them is taking a beet sheet and thumping a branch to knock the caterpillars into this sheet. On the other hand, there are many of the external feeders are highly colored, brightly colored. And many of these are distasteful or have protective adaptations such as stinging CD or urticating CD in the Lamacoda that's so brightly colored uh, on the right. There are some larvae that are gregarious, and we know about tent caterpillars and fall webworms that form these massive colonies, enclosing the leaves uh, or making a tent in the branches of the crotch of the tree and uh, feeding together, whereas others are solitary. During this series of presentations, we will be talking about several species and groups that are of economic importance. Among the speakers that you will hear, we will talk about a lot of the moths that are familiar to many of you. But this morning, I want to talk and do a little review of some of the less important moths from the economic standpoint, but nonetheless very important biologically and ecologically and of interest to all of us. I'm beginning with the most primitive group of Lepidoptera, the Micropterygid, the so-called jaw moths. They have mandibles. And with these mandibles, they can feed on spores and pollen. The larvae are feeding on liverworts. Here in North America, we only have three species. Whereas if you go to other parts of the world, there's about 130 or more, uh, many undescribed species in this group. I spent a month in New Caledonia collecting Micropterygids several years ago. And here are two of the species that I collected, including one at the bottom, that when you squint your eyes, if you squint your eyes and look at it, it may remind you of a jumping spider. And in fact, if you put this photograph with photographs of jumping spiders, it's very difficult to pick it out. These <coughs> jaw moths in, in New Caledonia included, at the time, only three described species. I collected an additional 27 new species during the one month, and others have been collected since I was there. The Prodoxidae are the yucca pollinators, although sometimes they're cheaters in that they don't pollinate the plant, the flower, but they do take advantage of living in the plant. Some as stem borers, some in the seed pods. The yucca pollinators are fascinating in that they have some long development in some species. Dr. Jerry Powell, University of California, Berkeley, once collected some yucca and put them in these garbage pan, uh, cans uh, behind his shed and he wanted to rear them out. He kept them outside so they could have close to the natural temperatures during the winter time. He went out the next year and he found some moths had emerged. He said, well, I think there are more still in there. So he kept it another year and he had more moths emerging. He had yucca moths emerging from this yucca plant for 18 years. And this is ideal because yuccas don't always bloom every year. 
There may be a long period of time between blooming, but these moths have adapted to ensure that they will find flowers at the time when uh, they emerge. Taneidae, as I mentioned, are rather unique and not including many plant feeders, if any. I'm sure there are some. The adults have these bushy heads and they have palpi that got these spine-like CD that stick out, very distinctive, and uh, you'll get to see some of these later. The larvae are scavengers or fungivores, and they include the clothes moths. There are others that feed on hair, and uh, there's one shown in this uh, image at the bottom that makes cases. Look, they look like they're open at both ends. I, I call these the bathroom moths because people always find them in bathrooms. And I kept one alive and fed my hair to it and they did quite well feeding on human hair. There's a family Psychidae that include the male sex with wings, whereas the females are wingless. They will remain in the bag and the males will find them and mate them. The female fills the bag with eggs, drops to the ground, and the eggs overwinter in the case. When the eggs hatch, the larvae make these cases and will feed on various plants and then pupate within the bag. In teaching my insect taxonomy class, I had a student that he was not, I would describe, the best student. And when I looked at his required collection, I noticed there were uh, summer forms of some species that he had collected in March or April. There were things he collected that don't occur in our area. And then I saw this bagworm moth that he collected in April. And, I put, and I, so I called him and I said, I want you to pull out all of the insects that you have not collected or that you made up the label data. So he pulled out about half of them. But he did not pull out the bagworm. I said, what about that? He said, oh, I got that to the tennis court last week. I didn't believe him. The very next year, at my light behind my house, I found a bagworm in April, an adult. So although they, autumn moths have these biologies, there are always mistakes made. And so although they would usually overwintering the eggs. This one evidently overwintered as a pupa with the moth emerging in the spring. Nymacodidae includes some species of moths that are brightly colored and others that are drab, but the caterpillars typically are just fascinating with their coloration. And they're advertising themselves. We say aposomatic because they have the stinging or urticating CD. I've had phone calls from physicians and emergency rooms with children who had come in contact with a saddleback caterpillar and who had rashes extending up their arm from it. I have a photograph here of Harrison G. Dyer. Harrison G. Dyer was known for his early work on limacodids. He was a fascinating man and recently a book has been published by Mark Epstein on moths, myths, and mosquitoes about Harrison G. Dyer. And not only was he a specialist on the moths, especially the microlepidoptera, but mosquitoes. And he had a fascinating life uh, that you can read about. I highly recommend the book. The next family are the Pteraphoridae. These are unique in the lepidoptera and having uh, the forewing that's got a cleft and one cleft in the forewing and two in the hindwing. I find these sometimes flying in dusk or daytime. Um, some will come to lights at night, and they're just beautiful moths. When they're at resting, they sort of roll the wings out and hold them out uh, straight out from their body. Some of these pterophores have larvae that are internal bores. They can uh, even be found in herbaceous and shrubby plants, woody tissue. When we get to the butterflies, and the skippers. These are day flying and although there's one example of a tropical species of butterfly that flies at night, but 99.9% .9 fly during the daytime. The Hesperiidae, or known as skippers, have uh, larvae that, with a large head and then there's a constricted neck behind it and they often feed on legumes and grasses and sedges some of them make leaf shelters, folding the leaf around and feeding within this shelter. 
They get the name skipper because when the adults go from one flower to the other, they have rather a, a quick skipping flight. The butterflies and the Papillionidae are the swallowtails with usually in, in our area in eastern U.S., tails that project from the hind wing. But if you go to the mountains in the western uh, U.S., you see uh, swallowtails without the tail, that the Parnassias that live at high elevations. The chrysalids of the Papillionidae are what we call naked in that they don't have a silk cocoon, although Papillionids will tie themselves to upright to a, a substrate with a silk belt. Uh, the larvae are interesting in that some of them have these eversible glands that they can uh, use evert for defensive compounds uh, and uh, they'll shoot out and may even have an alarm factor when they suddenly appear. They'll feed on a wide variety of herbaceous hosts. The blues, the hair streaks, Lysenidae, hair streaks having a hair-like projection off their hind wing. Uh, the larvae are somewhat flattened rather than round. And some of them uh, are tended by ants. They produce secretions to attract these ants, and the ants will feed the larvae versus regurgitation, and there's some very intricate relationships between ants and the, the, but, uh, the caterpillars that they tend. Sulfurs and whites, the PRID, uh, the whites have larvae that feed on crucifers, sulfurs feed on legumes. There are several agriculturally important species like the cabbage white, the, the, the sulfurs that get on alfalfa, alfalfa butterfly, and others that can be in large numbers. Nymphalidae are called brush-footed or foot, four-footed butterflies because the front pair of legs are rather reduced and they perch using four functional legs. It's a large family, over 6,000 species worldwide, and it's divided into a lot of subfamilies, one of which includes the well-known monarch butterfly. But these are the common butterflies that we often see flying around our houses and parks and, and natural areas uh, because there are so many species. The larvae of them are what I refer to as spiky. They have long projections and uh, so they're not uh, harmful in terms of uh, being stinging, but they have a distinctive look. Here are some references, including a recent checklist of Lepidoptera that's available online for North America, and also information on the phylogenomics that resolve the timing and evolution of the Lepidoptera. Thank you.